Astronomy is not present in most curriculum in Europe, but yoga and astronomy is a nice teaching because it's a valid cross-curricular topic. As a researcher, I think it's important to present some frontline research topic to combine the calendar and classical stuff from the previous century to, to show what the science is doing. Uh, in, especially in Europe, it's very important for us to, the, to have a multilingual approach and to develop the tools in the different languages. And also, we are sort of democratic. We think, it, we think it's important not to reach only the very good motivated teacher who will have done very interesting stuff without you, so I'm sure that they don't need you, even though it's nice to work with them, but to try to reach a large number of people. So, since 2004, we got three European funding, uh, gathering, evolving up to 15 partner countries. We received the Silver Award in 2009 for innovation, creativity, the lifelong learning program for create, innovate, and cooperate. We developed the strategy program, and in particular, we have now a series of strategy exercises. And I think the characteristic of this exercise series is to go from data to physics, so that we prepare the materials so that the kids can really do science. It goes some sort of bio investigation that they, they do with science. And that's a J, for those who do not heard about it, it's a multilingual software for education which enables the analysis of images and spectra. We have run 20 EU HOU training sessions for European teachers in car who will benefit from the, from the support of Discover the Cosmos and GDDP. So going back to this. EU, HOU, and W project, so it's connecting classroom to the Milky Way. So we have built up a partnership of 10 European countries, the partnership is here, and the country spotted in red, also the country who has accepted to host a 3 meter radio telescope for education. So there is Poland, Romania, France, Spain, and Portugal. So what is this project about? First, it's a big challenging project. Uh, we rely on our experience for the 2004-2006 project we run um, with the European funding on the ICT. We had our Swedish partner who developed a two-meter dish for education and enabling uh, pupils to observe the 21 centimeter line of the hydrogen of the Milky Way. However, even though it has been reliable and extensively used in classroom, it was limited in number of access, and also the pedagogical material prevents a large teacher to use it. So we think about it, and we can use this. So first, we develop technical multilingual tools adapted to pupils. So we have our five three meter radio telescopes that we installed in five different European countries. We the most crazy part was to develop a web interface to remotely control all of them and to observe from a single web interface. We have uh, developed also a simulator of hydrogen observation. Each observation performed with a network is stored in an archive. And also, we developed online tools to analyze the data. You can do everything from our post, typically by our we have developed some pedagogical support material, teacher manual, videos, podcasts. And one of very interesting things, and very important to, to introduce this to this material to school, is a kinesthetic, kinesthetic activity I will present in the next slide which enable to teach modeling concepts that are behind the ICT tools we developed. And also we have developed uh, outreach materials and exhibition, which then is our panel translated in ten different languages. And the key role of all this, as we heard yesterday, is to use multiple representation. Each concept is addressed in a different in several ways. So here you have an example of uh, a kinesthetic activity we ran in Paris in 2000, 
Then I'm going to probably recognize two famous actors. Ah, 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 here. Ah. And also we have the sun. It's a shadow. I don't know if the sun is somewhere from Sheffield. So the sun is on the back. So what we do with this is first we draw a short from orbits that uh, model the Milky Way. And first on the here on the top we were showing we have the actors um, mimic the rotation of the gas in the Milky Way. And we can show the difference between a rigid rotation and a differential rotation. And more interestingly, we can make some more physics. If you take a bungee cord, you can demonstrate some velocity pattern in the different contents of the Milky Way. I will go back to this later. But here in short, you see that when the core of the bungee cord is stretched, that means the red shift. The velocity is positive, and the gas is moving away from you. And when the
just a communal phase. Yeah, that's, that's, that's not really happening. No, no, no. We can superimpose. Yeah, yeah. And, and actually, we, we have the simulator. Would you take, take the mic, please? Actually, we have the simulator, actually, which is based on professional archive where you have a very good simulator equation. And uh, if you think, if you take uh, an exposure that's large enough, you have a very good signal to noise so far. So it was not a priority to cover the spectrum. Who else? Looks, looks like with uh, ask a question, please. No one? All right. So, we go to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Pamela L. Gay, from the Center of STEM Research Education Outreach at Southern Illinois University. The title of her lecture is The CosmoQuest Virtual Research Facility, Motivating Everyday Scientists. And um, that she is an expert on that, as she, she has shown yesterday at the Science Cafe. We build part of the universe with living bodies, which was very convincing, a lot of fun, and very also enlightening to, to understand the, the rhythm of the universe. Yeah. Okay, this is a locked. Does anyone know how to get to the presentations on this computer? So what's fascinating is when we finally hit the worst technical issues, we're streaming this live out on the internet right now. <coughs> I have one of those coffees for me. One when you brought over. No, 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 Okay, we seem to have regained control of the technology. I have to admit, I am a Mac user and a Linux user, and when confronted with a misbehaving Windows system, I go into the blue screen. Yeah. So I run a project called CosmoQuest. And our goal in creating this was to brainstorm what are all of the things that I as an astronomer would want in the best research center I can imagine. I, I sat down with several peers and we brainstormed, well, we want to have star parties. What brings the public to a research center? Well, star parties is one of those things. I want seminars. So I can constantly learn from other people about what is the state of the art in all the different research fields. I want access to a planetarium so that I can project the sky. And the ability to walk down the hallway and knock on a colleague's door and say, what do you think of this crazy idea? Well, we brainstormed all these different things and came up with Basically, these different ideas. We want science, we want learning, we want professional development, resources, community. We want all these things. And then we set out to build it in a virtual environment. Now, this is a conference on teaching and learning and pedagogy, and so I can't focus on all these different details. So I encourage you to visit our site, cosmoquest.org. I will give you a taste of what we have. This is our landing page. You can see we highlight the science opportunities up front with pictures. But we also highlight the classes that we teach, the virtual uh, presentations like this one that we give to people on the internet. We have a blog and we have a forum. 
And all of our citizen science projects are built with a similar interface so that you can intuit how it should work. Just like when you go from Word to Excel, things are different, but you know where to find the save button. We work to keep the interfaces uniform, and all of our interfaces include a tutorial video to help you get started. Now, our goal in building this was to create a place where people would learn and do science. There's lots of places where you can go online to contribute to science just by clicking. It uses pattern matching skills to generate new results that become journal articles. But we wanted to go further. And research, one of the first big things that people came up with in how we learn is that there's this thing called Bloom's taxonomy. It's the steps that the average person goes through while they're learning.
please. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about Nokia, uh, which is the tool that we've been uh, developing at the University of Athens. Uh, the name Nokia is an acronym of uh, the words hybrid cubes and access to interactions and atlas. And the name, of course, comes from Nokia uh, of uh, Alexandria, who was the first uh, woman of foundation. Now, Ipatia uh, is an event display. That means that it takes uh, real data from the Atlas experiment, which I'm sure you've uh, all heard of. Uh, it's one of the two main experiments uh, of the LHC at CERN. So it takes real data from that, and it visualizes it uh, in a way uh, in which students can use it and analyze it in a way it's similar to what real scientists do. It has been uh, developed uh, through a series of uh, European projects, and uh, currently it is part of uh, Discover the Discovery of Osmos for Sending and uh, GOLA. Uh, our goal is to target uh, students of uh, all ages. Uh, we currently use it for high school students, but we also use it at the university. Uh, for the students that have uh, chosen a uh, nuclear part in physics, uh, in the physics department. Uh, a few quick words about Atlas. I'm uh, sure you've all heard of it. Uh, it's uh, Atlas is one of the two main experiments of the LHC. Uh, it's a huge collaboration with more than 2,000 uh, physicists. The Atlas detector itself. Uh, it's a uh, cylindrical in shape. It is uh, uh, situated uh, around uh, 80 meters below ground in a facility very close to the central CERN facility. Uh, I'm sure those of you who have visited the CERN have been to the Atlas control room. In this So this was a video on how far it is accelerated in the LHC, but we have to do here. Um, so very quickly, we have two beams, uh, which usually consist of the protons, uh, that collide inside each one of the experiments. And through that collision, the particles are produced. Uh, and we had an 8 TeV energy at the end of, uh, of this round. And what is interesting is that some of those particles are stable, so we, we can uh, see them, we can detect them, but some of those particles are not stable. So they very quickly decay into other particles, and the only way uh, that we can infer the existence of the original particles is to see the products and combine them in a way that can show us the original particles. And this is the exercise that we do usually with uh, Ipatia, with uh, Z and Higgs boson. You know, I'm sure it's okay. So this is basically the same thing. Uh, each particle is a different uh, according to its kind. So uh, in the inner chamber, only the charged particles will uh, drive. Then we have uh, the electromagnetic calorimeter, and in, uh, in which electrons, for example, stop and deposit their energy so we can measure it. Uh, the next layer is the hadronic calorimeter, where hadrons uh, like protons stop. So again, in this way we measure their energy. And uh, the blue uh, outside layer is the muon chambers, and only the muons reach this part of the detector. Uh, there's also one more kind of uh, particle that uh, you will be seen, which is the neutrinos. And we can only infer their existence by the missing momentum uh, in our events. Regarding the Mavia, we have uh, two separate versions. The first version 
uh, started development around 2006. It is an extension of uh, an event display that is being developed by CERN called uh, Atlantis. And uh, it is a full featured event display. It has all the bells and whistles and configurations I think and everything you expect from a uh, real professional event display that can be used by actual researchers. Um, its main use today is in the international physics master classes every year since 2008. But we have also developed an outlet, which is a simplified version. It has all the capabilities needed to do exercises in the schools. So this is geared towards high school students. Now this has, uh, besides being simpler, uh, it's also easier to use because you don't need to download it, you don't need to download the events, you just go to the website like we show here and use it. You just need to have uh, Java installed because both are written into Java. So this is what we have to do inside. Um, it might a bit complicated first, but it's really not. Uh, Uh, so for, for this website, you can uh, find the uh, information on Papia, on the LHC, others, and of course, uh, uh, yeah, information on how to do those uh, exercises at your schools. This is a, a brief overview of uh, uh, some of the activities that we have uh, done with Papia, as I said, it's part of the International Physics Masterclasses since uh, 2008, and in 2007 <coughs> in the Athens Masterclasses. Um, we use it at the university, at our nuclear physics club, and we have done uh, many, over the course of these years, many, many masterclasses at schools which follow the International Physics Master Classes format, but uh, with contents. This is a, a map of what we did uh, uh, last year. So we want all of the pieces you can see in, in, in Athens and lower chest. In total, we did 23 events uh, last year, and many of them in collaboration with uh, the so we uh, used the idea with more than 200 students and uh, 200 teachers and 600 students. And this is excluding the international physics master classes in which about two to three thousand students in 58 institutes used the uh, idea. And in closing, this is uh, let's say a happy coincidence. Last year, on the 4th of uh, July, on the Higgs day was an announcement that it was made, we were in Crete, and the next day we held one of those mini master classes and we allowed students and teachers to discover the heaps that they had uh, heard about the previous day. Uh, so, <coughs> thank you. 
So there's an easy process to make uh, curves of cross section versus energy. For, uh, uh, yes, the students have to identify the graphs that uh, come from uh, the side or things to get with the exercise and insert them in the environment of the So this automatically generates the histogram. If they do it over, let's say, 50 times, they get a nice histogram that shows them much of the market in their one question from, from me. Ask yourself, any of the maybe 25, 30 teachers here in this room would like to use this in their classrooms throughout Europe. What would they need to do to, to get in contact and to make it function in their classrooms? Um, well, first of all, uh, there are a lot of teachers who uh, don't uh, want to do it themselves. So uh, it brings a lot of teachers invite us. Uh, and we go and do this exercise uh, in their class, or maybe they gather students from two or three schools and we do this for them. Uh, but uh, also, if uh, they go to our website, they can find the exercises and they can find information on what they need to do. And of course, we can uh, always help them uh, in any way we can. And we have actually been uh, to, to schools outside of Greece to do events like this. So it's not out of the question. If they uh, got enough students, we could go to their schools and, uh, and uh, help them organize such an event. Thank you. Any more questions? Does this sound exciting to you, this option? OK. So um, let's continue with our fourth speaker. That's Sarah Eve Roberts from the AU University <coughs> Awareness Project, the Netherlands. And the title of her presentation is Universe Awareness, Online and Physical Infrastructures for Science Education. And what um, caught my attention um, with her abstract is that this is also about citizen science, uh, what Brett Pamela presented, it's um, drawing on volunteers to do scientific work. And the novelty comes up with what you will be presenting, Sarah. Um, they, are being, they are relying on, or they are trying to get interested people with underprivileged backgrounds. So I'm very interested to hear what you have to say. Yeah, we have some of our volunteers here, actually. So first of all, I want to explain how many people know about this project already. Explain how it's not going to be so experienced That's all? OK. So this is going to be for everybody else. So yes, on the second Sarah Roberts of the day, of the day in my process, which is why I've got E in the middle of my name. See how it does make sense? Okay, so universal violence is a Europe-wide and global effort to brainstorm needs children. But we don't want to just educate children about astronomy. We don't want to create an army of astronomers. Our idea is to inspire children, get them excited about all that around them, get them excited about science, and enhance their understanding of the world. Let them bring out the natural astronomer that is inside of every child. Let them demonstrate their own power of crystal thinking. 
And astronomy provides a unique perspective. If you look at the world from space, it's not divided, there's no borders, it's one world for all, one sky for all. And we want to use this idea to broaden the children's minds and hopefully to stimulate a lasting sense of tolerance and global citizenship. So Universal Alliance actually started in 2006, but in 2007, uh, sorry, 2011, we received a grant of 2 million euros to set up a European branch called European Universal Alliance. And this had three core tasks. The first is to create a global network for the sharing of ideas, best practices, and resources around the world. The second was to create educational astronomy-based materials be used by children and with children, particularly inquiry-based activities, which we've heard a lot about this conference. And the third is teacher training. A lot of teachers without um, scientific backgrounds, or primary school teachers, don't have the confidence or don't feel that they have the knowledge or the tools to bring science into the classroom. So we want to train them and give them these resources so that they can do this. And I'd say that we've been quite successful so far. In seven years, we've managed to cross the globe, and we have 57 member countries at the moment, including the six EU Maui countries, which actually only includes five, you know, uh, five European countries, the UK, Germany, the Netherlands, Italy, and Spain, and South Africa, as you can see, around right the world. And we have, actually this number is wrong, it's closer to 1,000 volunteers around the world now, educators, astronomy researchers, and, and uh, communicators. And a big, with a network this big, coordination is a big asset. Our motto is think globally, but act locally. Local culture and local languages, obviously, are very important when you're teaching children. But we do have a central support hub, which is based in Leiden in the Netherlands, which is where I work. And we try to provide support. We have very quick email responses for our network. We provide best practices. We connect people. We let them know about activities that are going on around the network and opportunities. And we even help them find funding. And we provide some flagship programs, such as the Universal Box, which I'll talk more about later on. So, the main way that we keep in contact with our network is through our international website. As you can see, it's got an events section. We have a repository of all our educational resources. We update tips for communicating astronomy there, for example. Uh, news, conferences such as this one. We also have all our social media. We're very active on social media. And if you look on the left-hand side, you can see the six national EUNI websites. They all have their own national pages and uh, websites from all the local opportunities. And here's an example of some of them. And more recently, we've even had Japanese and Polish websites set up. And another way that we connect our network is through our annual international workshops. This is the one from 2012, and it was very successful. We had 55 participants from 28 different countries, and this included three members of the National European Parliament, and even represent representatives from the EU Commission. There were a range of different things discussed at the workshop, including evaluation, which is something that we've been working on throughout this year. Something very important, but quite difficult in such a big project, especially when you work with young children. And speaking of the international workshop, I would like to invite you all to this year's international workshop, which will be held in October in Heidelberg. And if you're interested in attending, you can find out more on our website. I'll give you the address again. You can find out how to apply for travel grants or how to register. So our second core test is resources. I'd probably say the first core test, actually. Um, we have around 80 educational resources at the moment, everything from an earth ball, activity guides, books, and it's very important to us that they are all open source and that they can be adapted to cultural and linguistic needs. And in 2011, we actually won the Science Magazine Sport Award, which is the Science Prize for Online Resources and Education. One of our main resources, I don't know how many people here have heard of it, it's called uh, Spacescape. It 
it was mentioned in an earlier presentation. So I actually write space at the moment, and it is an astronomy news service for children around eight and up. The idea of the space group is our partner organizations, which include NASA Chandra, the European Space Agency, and Strong, European Southern Observatory. If they have a new scientific discovery, or <laughs> if they have a new um, scientific discovery, they let us know. They send us a press release. We translate it into a language that's understandable, understandable for children, and make it shorter. And then we co-release it alongside the press release. And the idea is to show children that astronomy is still exciting, it's still active, it's not a dead subject, and maybe they can even contribute something to it in the future. So since it began in March 2011, we've had almost 200 space games. We have around two a week at the moment. And our fantastic network of volunteers from around the world, and now translating them into 22 different languages. Um, and they are being used in many classrooms. We're not quite sure how many. It's hard to get feedback on this sort of thing. But we know at least a few classrooms around our global network. And they're being distributed in a range of children's media, including Wired, uh, AAA as to recall it, and an iPad application called Tingle 2, and a UK magazine called NRA. And this is a photograph from an activity we did earlier this year in the Netherlands. Um, it was an activity based around space school. And the children, the children of it, they learn about a lot of different exciting uh, stories that happen this year, black holes, exoplanet discoveries, storms on Saturn. They were actually chasing those out of the building asking those questions at the end of the page. My class is a And another research, uh, resource, sorry, is the Universe in a Box. And this is a physical educational kit that provides all of the materials, activities, and background information that primary school educators need to bring astronomy to their classroom. This is a picture of the Universe in a Box. easier to split them up to do these activities. And the next phase, which should be underway by the end of the month, is to send a thousand boxes to a thousand schools. And if anyone is interested in trying out a box or ordering one, you can do this online. I'll give you the website again. And I'll let you know that it is a one-for-one -one, um, 
project. So if you buy a box, then we will send a box to a disadvantaged community. And here is a few pictures of the universal box in action around the world. So with all these resources, distribution is a big issue. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with Astronet, but it's an EU commission network um, designed to get astronomy into schools. And their recommendation, recommendation number four, is to implement a centralized web-based distribution system for educational materials and a range of languages. So we did have a look into the existing systems for this, and I won't point anything ahead, but we found a few problems. Many of them require a login, they're cluttered and hard to navigate, they're restricted to one language generally and not often maintained. And I think the biggest problem is review. There's very limited content review, which means that the quality of our is not very trustworthy. So we decided along with LCLGT, Yanawi is leading a project called AstroEdu, which is a new peer review platform for educational astronomy research uh, resources. So it will be the first peer reviewed astronomy educational resource platform. It will make the best resources accessible to educators all around the world. And the idea is that educators can use it to find, review, redistribute, translate, and improve educational resources. So this is how the process will work. Anybody can send us an activity. We'll have one central editor, curator, who will keep track and regularly update the website. They will receive the activities, and then they will send them to a panel of reviewers, which will include one, at least one research astronomer for a scientific content check, and an educator to check the educational content. It will then be sent back to the edit editor before being sent to an editorial board and then it can be sent for publication. From there, educators can find it, translate it, evaluate it, and distribute it as if used. And here is the timeline for AstroEdu. It's not online yet. As you can see, we're currently in the development phase, and we hope to have the beta release.
aspects of the system and attempt to build a reasonable plan for global HODL usage of such telescopes. These systems are steadily growing and the web and and Working on it. Sorry. We didn't have the ability to check this this morning ahead of time. Um, Vivian is there. I'm hoping she'll turn on her audio and video so that we see more than her icon. Vivian, we can't see we can't see or hear you. Please. <sighs> Please send us information. Oh, there's Vivian again. There we go. Can you say something? <laughs> Good morning, everybody. <laughs> I guess it's the afternoon now. Okay, good. I got an uh, I got a clapping. So are we done? <laughs> anyway, hi. 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 I'll turn on my video so you can see the room. Just a second. Okay. Apparently, it won't let me turn my video on at the moment. But trust me, there's a room filled with people who can see you. So how about it? How about it? Okay, and I was watching an earlier presentation, so I did get a glimpse of the group. So good. Um, you know, I'm sorry, it is morning here, and um, in my life, when I use telescopes, morning is every start of every section of the day. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, I guess I should say good afternoon to you guys who are in Greece. And uh, now the next challenge will be to screen share. So let me see if that works. And um, there are two things I want to tell you about. Um, one is an opportunity, and this is a sane opportunity for those of you who are um, from Europe or from other continents than uh, North and South America because we have a telescope that you can use directly that is in California. Now, can, can you see my screen yet? Yes, we can see you. We've been okay. able to see it. Okay, okay, so can I see my screen is the next question. <laughs> that I can't help you with. Um, so are you looking at the screen that um, has... We see a Remote planetary nebula, two yes, telescopes. Yes, yes. Okay. Thing. Great. Okay. So I just have to find that one myself. Okay. All right. This is the screen that you're looking at. It has a planetary nebula. This is a picture of this telescope in California. Um, it's at a vineyard. These are olive trees. Um, so it's kind of Grecian-like, right? And um, this is a picture of um, the secondary on the telescope. It's a 20-inch telescope and here's a picture of the CCD camera. Now, um, if you are using this facility, you'll have to get um, a key um, and we'll, we'll uh, go into that more directly, but I just want to give you a taste of what it's like. So, um, this is the sign-in page and you would go to the login and I'm already logged in, but you put in your phone number and your email. You also arrange this ahead of time with me. Um, and then, and then um, we're going to go to the targeting page. Now, I don't know how fast the screen is uploading. Can you see a new page that says targeting? Yes. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to open up the observatory and Actually, the sun hasn't risen there yet, so um, it's about, it's probably about minus nine degrees, so it's pretty close to rising. Um, here is the observatory opening, so there's a webcam, and you can see that it's still dark skies there. I'm going to turn the, I had turned the lights on, I'm going to turn those lights off. Well, maybe I'll leave them on for a moment. 
um, because I want you to see the telescope slew. So now I'm going to go back to telescope control and um, targeting once again. And here's a picture of the sky uh, that the telescope can see. And I'm guessing that probably M15 might be a target that we could look at. Uh, so there is a catalog. Um, let's see, I'm looking for something bright that we can see in just um, a few minutes. So probably M39, which is a, a open cluster, would be a good target. So I just choose that. And um, now the the um, the um, little map shows you where the telescope is and where it's going to go by these two lines. So we're going to ask it to slew, and then I'm going to switch over here to the to the um, page where you can see the telescope moving. So this gives you a real sense of you know real time control of the telescope. So are you seeing the telescope moving? Yes. Okay, so now that gets an applause, I think. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> and especially those of you who are from Europe can do this at the same time of the day and not in the middle of the night like we have to do it here in the U.S. Um, so at this point, I'm going to turn the lights off, and I am going to go to another page. I keep I, I have many uh, tabs open, so I can do everything at once. Um, so now we want to acquire an image. So um, this is a globular cluster. It's pretty bright. So we're going to just use this 10-second um, exposure time. I'm going to add a date to the title and we'll click on take an image so um, of course if you're taking a two or a three minute image when you're taking the image you cannot navigate away from the page which is why I whoops you know what I forgot to oh I didn't forget to turn off the lights now you can see how bright it is out there <laughs> as compared to inside the telescope but I always like to go and look at the telescope and see what it's what it's doing and when it's really nighttime you can actually see the stars in the background of the sky. So back here this was our targeting and wow okay so um, all I see this is actually a bit of dust on the, the camera so maybe that was way too long of an exposure. We might do this because it's bright out. I'm going to try a two-second exposure. Um, so once this one um, arrives, yeah, we're we're not getting much. Um, we're not getting stars. So let's pretend we had um, we had actually gotten an exposure, and let me show you how you then look at it. So I'm going to go back to this page, and I'm going to go over to image processing. And we have, we do have a Fitz viewer online, and we can actually do some image processing online with this system. We can also, we also have an image processor that is, um, that is not online. So earlier today, I took some pictures. What month is it? August. August 3rd, okay, uh, for you, and I just took a picture of the sky, wherever the telescope um, was pointing at the time, and let's see, okay, so let me see and do a little histogram here, which allows you to see more, okay, you can see a few stars, that's not very exciting, let's, um, let's pick a different one. So I'm going to go up to a, um, a time when I was actually more serious. <clears throat> so um, let's see, July maybe. Okay, June 17th. Let's try that. And I think here, um, well, I don't want to do that one. Okay, so here's where I should have decided exactly 
which um, date I was going to use for you. We can hear your birds waking up. I know I did that on purpose. <laughs> I'm glad you can hear them. I wanted to really emphasize it was morning, and for a person who uses telescopes at night, that's a little bit hard. <laughs> um, okay. Mm, all right. We're gonna, you know, we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pick a directory of um, one of my uh, an eighth grade student that I work with all the time. So Josh. So this is a kid who's actually possessed about using this observatory. And um, okay, uh, let's see. By the way, um, one of the people that is there with you um, is um, Chuck Reilly and his wife Sue, and they um, have been at the observatory. Okay, there's there's a little cluster for you. Let's make it a bit brighter. So if this would have been a little earlier or a little later, you could have, um, I'm afraid that you, can, you can't actually really see it. Okay, so there's the histogram. And these things here, this are dust donuts, but you know what, they're made from the neighbor's tree that is like a cottonwood tree, and so big blobs of cottonwood seed end up on the CCD. And then we have to go, like, I told them, I told the owners they have to go and use a leaf blower to, to get rid of the cotton would um, fluff. Anyway, so that is a demonstration of a telescope that I would love to share with educators um, you know, on other continents uh, when they will be able to use um, the observatory real time. Now, hmm. Vivian, I'm being yes. reminded that you have less than 10 minutes left, and they're asking if you can switch, switch to Skynet, please. Yes, that's exactly what I was going to do right now. So this is a perfect time. OK, so here is um, Skynet. And um, this, um, what's nice about Skynet, actually, let me try to get to the home page here. Um, is that actually Carl's telescope? His hands-on universe 30-inch telescope is on Skynet. You need so, to switch which window you're screen sharing. You're still screen sharing oh, the browser. You. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. Click, click screen share again. It will switch to your face, and then click it one more time and select the window you need. Okay, but that means I have to go back to find my Google window. Alt tab. Okay, thank you. Alt, you can, I can tell that you've done this many times before. <laughs> this would control tab on a Mac. Yes. Or command tab. Rather. The way, uh, this is a picture that um, that same kid Josh took with the uh, with the twenty inch telescope that I just showed you. Um, okay. Yeah, use command tab. Didn't mean to, and now I'm in window confusion. Okay. Um, there's an easier way to do this. You you were on this page right now, actually. Well, I did the same thing to my computer. You did to yours. One sec. Okay. All right. So I was teaching you what to do wrong, and um, all right. So just uh, while we're doing this, I'm going to go back to targeting and close up because this is important that you remember to do this. So it's just closed down. Now that's done. OK, Sky. Oh, how about that? You can see it now? Yes. OK, so I just changed to, um, this is the Skynet homepage. This is where you log in. The login um, is HOU. And the password is Super One Nova. Because you this is public on the web. Yeah. Okay, well, we can change the password then. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, and that's because Carl's, um, you know, a super one Nova kind of guy. 
and um, the um, um, so I I I would hmm. I just want to show you here this ARO 30 inch that is Carl's telescope it's uh, managed by Bob Holmes um, and you can see the other telescopes that um, are talking to Skynet right now including the Yerkes 41 inch telescope um, so if we wanted to make an observation we go to observation manager and um, I did put in some observation for you last night but there's also uh, plenty of other observations that um, other HOUers have put in so let's say what object would you like Carl Pennypacker? M1 of course. M1. Okay. Except isn't M1 kind of by the sun right now? So let's just say that we wanted um, maybe M15. Is that okay with you? Okay. All right. So, um, or let's say that we wanted, I'm going to change my mind, um, M74 because there's a supernova in it right now. So y it looks up the observation for you, supernova 2013. Uh, so I'm just going to add that to this. And we're going to use the Yerkes telescope because um, perhaps um, I will um, be able to get that image for you coming up tonight. And so we're going to use the three GRI prime images and a clear image. And then it shows me, okay, so we can't see it right now. Yerkes is the yellow one. ARO 30 is the green one here. Um, so we're going to pick Yerkes. Uh, actually, I'm going to, I'm rethinking this a little bit. I'm going to take these out and just do clear. Hmm. Oh, actually, no. We're just going to go this way. Okay, so we're going to choose the Yerkes 41-inch telescope, and um, we're going to ask for um, one image uh, for 80 seconds in each of these filters because it's a galaxy so we want a little bit of a longer exposure and then we'll just click on next here and we see a summary of our observations so we'll confirm that and now this is in the queue so um, <clears throat> so so um, after you get your observations th this is a set that was taken last night I when I uh, woke up during the night it was still cloudy here so I put this in with um, the the Gort telescope in California this is a different California telescope um, and so we have th that telescope actually did take pictures of this um, object and I am I think the supernova is this one. The image is a little off center, so I'm not 100% sure that it got it. But you can see that you have your image. You can preview it online. Now, um, another thing you can do with this, with um, Skynet, is you can af actually go to Afterglow. Whoa, let's see unc.edu slash afterglow and here again you need to log in don't say it out loud yeah. okay there I have to <laughs> and you are out of time so if okay. you can magically pull it out of the oven completely baked uh, perhaps but anyway, I don't want to take any more time. I just want to show you that you can actually see some um, images online here. So this is the one that I just showed you. And if we open it up, there it is. And now you can do all kinds of image processing with it. Okay, all done. Thank you, guys. <laughs>
and I wish I was there with you. I'm going to go to the Lions Camp today in northern Wisconsin, and we're going to do all this with kids who are blind. So <laughs> um, and we're going to have a blast. So um, enjoy your conference and um, and uh, have a great time. Stay online for a second. Uh, Carl is asking you to stay online, Vivian. Sure. What's up? Vivian, thank you very much for this live demonstration. Uh, I'm the chairman of the session. We have to close now. So, okay. Uh, that was Just very impressive. Just one thing? Yeah. Uh, what, I think what, see, we have priority on, on the HOU 30 inch telescope. So, people from Romania or Serbia or wherever, you know, can join and use our telescope. It's a Q-based system. You request it, it comes back later. It's different than other telescopes. But you know, again, this is now a GHOU resource, uh, freely available. You know, we have passport, passwords. Other telescopes we don't have priority on, so the images come back later. But the, the SkyNet is, is a very slick, easy-to-use system. We should probably build it into Salsa J. Actually, I think that might be kind of interesting. Yeah, these uh, images are all open in Salsa J. Well, let's close the session. We witnessed a live demonstration of the Skynet, which was very impressive. Thank you all for having attended this session. Hopefully, with a lot of insights into what can be done, how you can work with your students in the next future, in the next few months. Um, we will have a break now. There's, there's, a, there's a couple before we, can, we will continue. Uh, another session, and of course, here's Rosa. She wants to make an announcement already at the beginning. Now it's your turn, Rosa. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to tell the people that are presenting posters that uh, at the very beginning of the poster session, those of you who want to 